In this video, I'm going to introduce physics and I'm also going to talk about measurements. So let's start with physics. Physics is a science that deals with energy and matter and it also deals with how those two interact. Matter is anything that has mass and that occupies space. Whereas energy is the ability to do work. So what do I mean by that? Anything you can imagine that has mass and occupies some space, that's matter. So your car, your phone, your, your pen, they are all matter, right? Now, what about energy? Energy is not matter precisely, but energy is that ability to do work. In other words, it could be the ability of matter to do work. So anything that has some ability to do work you can say that thing has energy. So think about it this way. If you raise a very heavy stone up by two meters and you drop it on a crate of egg, those eggs will be smashed. So what, we, what you have basically done is you've added what they call potential energy when you raised the stone, you've added potential energy to that stone. You've given that stone a potential energy. At the time you dropped it, that energy, that energy was unleashed on those eggs. That ability to do work, that ability to smash eggs was given to that stone at the time you raise it. So you say that stone has kind of a potential energy. So the whole idea of energy is this. Anything, anything that has the ability to do work, a, an explosive has energy because once it explodes, it does work. The work will be pushing things around, pushing dust around, and knocking some things off. That is energy. So physics has to do with studying those two concepts and seeing how matter and energy interact. In physics, we do a lot of measurements. You measure all the time. You measure time, you measure length, you measure uh, force, you measure pressure. You do all kinds of measurements. And that's why you can't do physics without measurement. And what do we measure? We measure physical quantities. So physical quantities like time, like length, and so on. They are all physical quantities, things that that we can we, that, that exist in the physical world. That's these are these are physical quantities. Now, what are what are the various? How do you express uh, when you take measurements of a particular physical quantity? How do you express it? So let's say I told you that the time that elapsed. Um, is 20 seconds. In physics, you write the number, which is the value of that quantity, and the units, which in this case is seconds, right? So I can write it like this. So we basically write, uh, express physical quantity as a number times the units. So that's how we express physical quantities. So now let's talk about the various, the two categories of physical quantities. Every physical quantities, quantities every physical quantity in physics can be either a base quantity or derived quantity. So I'm going to talk about the two categories or type of physical quantity. Then we'll list those uh, examples of physical quantities under each. So let's talk about base or fundamental physical quantities. Now we'll talk about these quantities. Base quantities are quantities that are independent and they, they do not, in other words, they do not depend on other quantities. In fact, other quantities depend on them. So this is, uh, this idea of fundamental quantities came about because physicists or scientists, they want to have a standard on which every other quantity will be based on. So they agreed on some quantities to be called base quantities and others to be called derived. Derived means the derived means it, it came from some other quantities, right? So these base quantities, they are seven in number and they, they are the standard on which every other quantity uh, de depend on basically. So I'm going to talk about each of those base quantities. So the first is length. So length is a physical quantity. It's all about distance, right? It's all about how far point A is from point B. So if I ask what's the length of your room, what's the length of, uh, what's your height, 
and uh, and so on. Those things are lengths. They are form of lengths. And the unit for length is the meter. That's the S I units. We have other units for length. We have feet. We have inches and so on. But the S I unit for length is the meter. S I stands for international standard. International standard. International system rather. So the reason why you see the S before the I is because the original form of SI unit is a French form, which is like uh, which starts with system with an E, the international. So it's just like the French version of international standard starts with the S part before the I. But in the English system, you call it international standard. So now, what about the 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 symbol? A length is represented with small letter L. That's that's typically what we re, what length is represented as. Then, how do you measure length, or what are the instruments that are commonly used to measure length? You you can use meter rule, you can use vinyl caliper, and you can use micrometer screw gauge. I'm going to talk about micrometer screw gauge and uh, the vinyl caliper. I'm going to explain how to measure, uh, how to read uh, length from those instruments. So let's talk about time. Time is the unit of time is a second, and the 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 symbol is s. That's the unit symbol. That's s, small letter s. Then the symbol of time is small letter t, and we use stopwatch to measure it. The mass is uh, the standard international. The 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 SI units for mass is kilogram, and the symbol of mass is m, and we use beam balance, chemical balance, and spring balance. To measure mass then the fourth is electric current which can be whose unit is amp the, the amp and uh, the abbreviation is a and so on so the fourth the fifth is temperature then the sixth is amount of substance which we call mole then the last is the luminous intensity so these are the si unit they are like the base units on which every other unit can be derived from. So now I'm going to talk about how I'm going to focus on length and length, the length, uh, time, and mass. I'm going to talk about how to measure them, the instruments that I use to measure them, and I'm going to talk about how to read some of those instruments. So this time I'm going to use a software known as Marvin Hub Physics Lab to, look, to, ex to explore that. Marvin Hub Physics Lab. Marvin Hub Physics Lab. So Marvin Hub Physics Lab provides virtual, uh, virtual exper a, a platform where I, where one can perform virtual experiments and also virtually explore physics apparatus. So let's take a look at how we can read length, time, and mass. So this is Physics Lab. So let's take a look at some apparatus that can be used to measure length, mass, and time. So let's talk about length. We can use the vinyl caliper to measure length. And we can also use the micrometer screw gauge to measure length. So, but if you want to explore this application and get to know, understand a lot about each of these instruments, you can download the, the application and explore for yourself. But in this case, I'm going to go to explore section and I'm going to explain how the how to read values from the vinyl caliper. So here we have a vinyl caliper. On this application, I can slide it left and right to simulate how, how it opens and how it closes. So let's take a look at this, this scenario. So what is the reading? So in this case, the reading, let me move the reading to 12 or 11 millimeter. So the question is, when given this kind of uh, diagram, how do you determine the reading? If you look at the diagram closely, you realize that we have 0, 1, 2, up to 10. Then what you should do is to look at this point where 
we have two skills basically. The, this is the main skill. The upper part is the main skill. The lower part is the vernier skill. The vernier skill is the one with the white uh, background. Now, on this main skill, what's the reading? The reading on the main skill is the point where the main scale inter where the main scale intersects with the zero mark on the vernier on the vernier scale. So the vernier scale tells you where to stop on the main scale. So this is ten, and this is eleven, right? So this is where you stop. So this means this is 11. But there are times when this zero on the vernier scale will not directly intersect with any of this line. In that case, it means there is an extra decimal that you have to, you have to get from the vernier scale. So what this means is, if for example, I have, um, let's take a look at 16 points. 16.7 so how the how 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 can i come about 16.7 so let's take a look at this this is 10 and this is 11 12 13 14 15 16. now from this 16 to this point where we have zero there is a small value that is not up to one so how do you know that this how do you know the the, the value of this small section that is from 16 to this zero value on the vernier scale that value can be determined from the vernier scale and where do you guys on the vernier scale we try to see the point where the vernier scale directly aligns with any value here so if you check closely you will see that we have seven it is at this point that we have a direct intercept a direct intercession between the main scale and the vernier scale so they align perfectly so that is the reason why we say this is 16.7 so this is whatever you have on the vernier scale you divide by 10 and that gives you 0 0.7 then you add it to 16 that gives you 16.7 so this is how you read from a vernier scale i'm going to drop a link where you can get more information on how to read a vernier scale and you can download this application to explore further now, what about the micrometer screw gauge? A micrometer screw gauge is very useful for measuring very thin objects. For example, you can measure the diameter of a wire with a with the micrometer screw gauge. Micrometer screw gauge has an accuracy level of 0 0.01, so which means you can measure 0, 0.0 something that is as small as 0 0.01 millimeter. So it can be used to measure the thickness of a paper, the thickness of a sheet of metal, and so on. So let's talk about how to read a micrometer screw gauge. So let's let me set it to a particular value and let's look at how this can be obtained. So the first is to understand that we have the mean scale here, and um, which is here, then we have the vernier scale, which is around this timbre. Now on this main scale, we have zero here, one, two, but we have the midpoint here. So this is zero, this is 0 0.5, this is one, this is 1.5, this is two, this is 2.5. So now we know this is 2.5 because this is the visible, this is the last visible, visible line. But the question is, what is this small section? What is the value of this small section remaining? Now, to get the value of this small section, we look at the vernier scale. Now, on the vernier scale, you have from zero, which is at the base, up to 30. It, it goes around the timbre. Now, the current value is at 30. So what this means is we're going to add what's what we have on the vernier scale to 2.5. But then what's what you have on the vernier scale should be divided by 100 because micrometer has a, 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 a an accuracy level up to 0 0.01 so you have to divide this 30 by 100 and if you do that you're going to get 0 0.03 and 0 0.3 rather not 0 0.0 0 0.3 now if you add 0 0.3 to 2.5 it's going to give you 2.8 so this is basically how you read from a micrometer screw gauge. I'm, go I'm also going to drop a link on how you can get more detailed information on how to read a micrometer screw gauge. So let's take a look at 
uh, mass. How do we measure? How do we? Uh, one of the instruments for measuring mass is spring balance. You can you can use beam balance and all of that, but spring balance can help you measure both uh, mass and weight. So there's a relationship between them. So now in this case, you you just suspend the 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 object or the yeah the ball the object you want to weigh. You suspend it with this hook, and then the reading will be read on this scale here. So on the left we have the mass and on the right we have the weight in Newton. So what about time? To measure time you use the stopwatch. So this part in this particular stopwatch we have the, the longer hand is the second hand while the smaller one is the minute hand. So that is this are some of the instruments you can use to measure uh, length, mass, and time. If you wish to explore further, I would recommend you get this application downloaded and you explore further. So now let's talk about derived quantities. Derived quantities are those quantities that we express in terms of the base quantities. So that's what derived quantities are. So an example, a simple example is the density, for instance. So let's take a look at density. We know density to be mass divided by volume, right? Now, we know that mass, the, the, the unit of mass is kilogram. And the unit of volume, volume is meter cube. That's, met, that's length times length times length. So density, the unit for density is kilogram per meter cube. So that's minus m raised to power minus, that's kilogram times a meter raised to power minus three. So now this is an example of derived quantity. Why is it called derived quantity? The reason is you can express density in terms of base quantities. This is a base quantity, which is mass. This is a base quantity, which is length, but then is length raised to the power of minus three. So now that is how, that is what a derived quantity is all about. So there are so many uh, derived quantities. There are so many of them. We can't list everything here. So here are some of them. Plane angle is a derived quantity. The, the SI unit of plane angle is radian. Now, radian is basically meter per meter. Now, what that means is this. Radian, radian is, a, is like degree, but it's not degree. It, but it's in the family of degree. Degree is just another way to represent angle. But the SI unit is radian. So the reason why uh, radian has some interesting property. That's why it's used as, uh, as the standard. Radian is basically a ratio between, between, between two lengths. That's what radian is basically all about. And that's why it is the, it, the, the base units are meter and meter because it's a ratio between two lengths. The ratio between two lengths will form the, the uh, radian. So let's talk about frequency. Frequency is basically uh, one divided by time. That's what frequency is all about. Is more or less like the number of oscillation or the number of you can call it oscillation or, or per, per per second. So the number of oscillation is unitless. Has n, then the time has a unit. So eventually, it is one over s, which is s raised by minus one. So frequency is also a derived unit. Then force is a derived unit. We know that force is mass times acceleration. You will get to know more about this as we as we discuss them later. So force is mass times acceleration. Ma mass is uh, a base quantity, and we know the the unit is kilogram. Acceleration is acceleration is meter per second squared. That's the unit, right? That is distance over second times uh, time times time. So if you represent this, you get 
this as the unit of force. So the same thing goes to other derived units. You can um, easily derive their, their base unit given that you know the formula for calculating each of those quantities. So we have a lot of them. We have pressure, we have energy. Energy and work, they have the same unit. They are all joule. And power is um, also a derived quantity. We have electric charge, electric potential, and so on and so forth. So these are derived quantities. Now let's talk about another interesting concept, which is um, prefixes. We use Sometimes we use prefix in representing Sometimes we use prefix and represent in shortening the, the, the value of a physical quantity. And that comes in handy, especially when you have a very large number for such. So we're going to talk about pre common prefixes in physics. So let's talk about that. So these are the common prefixes that you come across in physics. Now, let me just give an example. So imagine we have... A particular you have a particular measurement like this 5,000 watts so let's say you've got a measurement like this 5,000 watts and you've got another measurement of this kind 24 million watts now Think about what is what what has what is happening here. We've got a very large number. In physics, in order to make life much easier for us, we try to shorten this ex this value by saying instead of five thousand five with three zeros, we say five times. Let me just break it down. Five times one thousand watts, right? Which can be written as five. 5 kilowatts. Now, where is this K coming from? K is a prefix. Is a prefix to the watts. Now, what is a prefix? A prefix is something that comes before another thing, right? So if I say uh, something like, if I say something like pre- order this pre is a prefix you understand so this is the main word there is a prefix to this word so the same thing in physics we shorten quantities using prefixes so in this case we'll be writing five with three zeros i'll just say five k w which means five k is 10 raised to the power of three so which is one thousand right so you just say five k w which is five thousand watts so whenever you hear over, uh, what people say 5 kilowatts, 5 kilowatts, they are simply saying 5 times 10 raised to power 3 watts, which is equal as 5,000 watts. So what about, what about this? Using the same concept, you can represent this as 24 times 10 raised to the power of 6 watts. And what is 10 raised to the power of 6? 10 raised to the power of 6 is mega. So you say 24 mega watts. So this is a much compact representation of this. So these two are just the few examples of prefixes in physics. So we have a lot of them. So we have, let's start from the from the very top. So what for 10 raised to power 24, if you have any number that has let's say 24 zeros, so what do you you can shorten that and just say yukta. So instead of instead of um, you having something like 21 with 24 zeros, right? I just say 21 yota. If, if, if the unit is a meter, you write it as meter, right? So that is just a way to shorten 10 raised to the power of 4. Then we have zeta, we have exa, we have peta, we have tera, giga, mega, and so on. So it's very straightforward. 10 raised to the power 24 yota, if if it is smaller, so let's say we are dealing with something like this. So let's say we are dealing with 0 0.000015. In this case, if you if you take this uh, this one two three four five six, 
and that that means you can represent this as 15 times 10 raised to the power minus 6 because you are going this is a very small number it's more or less like dividing by this right so that's why it's going to be minus 6 now let's say this value is in meters right this is 0 0.00015 meters you can represent this like this and eventually you can represent it as as a micro 10 raised to the power minus 6 is micro so this is micro and you represent micro with mu symbol micrometer and you must have heard about nanotechnology so nano is 10 raised to the power of minus 9. so whenever you hear the word nanotechnology what that implies is these are technology that deals with a length that, that are small as 10 raised to the power minus 9 meters so with, what that means is if you have if you are working with a technology that tries to process things or construct things or create things that are small as this scale or somewhere around the scale maybe a bit higher than this scale we call that a nanotechnology so nano is 10 raised to the power minus 9 and pico is 10 raised to the power minus 12 and so on and so forth so you may find this you, 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 it's very important you you take note of all of this because you will come across all of this in physics things like centi milli micro and so on so now let's talk about the last concept which is which is dimensional analysis and dimensional homogeneity so let's talk about that in physics it's important that whatever equation we are referencing has a particular consistent pattern so now let's talk about what that pattern is there's something called dimensional analysis and what that means is it's a concept or is a is a is a kind of analysis that enables you to establish if the the unit within an equation or the, yeah, the unit of each term in an equation if those uh units have a certain consistency right so basically the entry analysis is of a set of units to establish the structure of an equation so i'm going to use this illustration so that you can understand so let's say we i told you that force is equal to mass times acceleration now the issue is can we say that the dimension of these two parts they are the same can we say they are the same if they don't have the same dimension then this equation will be will not be taken as a correct equation so before i can talk about the correctness of this equation the first thing is what is a dimension dimension is like units right it's like the way you express the units of each of these you know if i ask what is the units of mass the units you tell me it is kilogram right and if i ask what is the units of acceleration you tell me it is meter per second square but dimension tries to say okay instead of we using this kind of unit what if we use a symbol that represents the unit now the reason why dimension comes in handy is mass can be represented in different form aside kilogram because mass can be represented in terms of kilogram in terms of gram in terms of even other units that are not part of the si unit now instead of you having to worry too much about the exact unit you can say instead of using this let me just use m to represent the units of mass but this time around we call this dimension Dimension is a kind of unit, but this time around, it doesn't, it's, it's like a placeholder for a unit. It doesn't care what specific unit. So think about it. Length can be represented as centimeter, meter, this, uh, uh, you, you have decimeter, even feet, even inches, and so, inch and so on. Now, instead of you worrying yourself about which exact length are we dealing with here, 
we can just say, let's just represent this length as L dimension. The dimension of this length is L. L, instead of boring about each of these units. So dimension is a, is a width, is just like a kind of unit, but this time around, a unit that is independent of the, 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 the specific unit you are actually using. So, so now that we've talked about dimension, what are the common, what are the di co uh, uh, dimension of common um, uh, quantities, right? For length, we use L to represent within a square. If you notice, there's a square bracket. So you, you, you to represent a dimension, you must put that unit or that symbol within a square bracket. So length is L within a square bracket. Time is T in a square bracket, mass is M in a square bracket, current is I in a square bracket, and so on and so forth. So now, how do we represent force, the dimension of force, using the same pattern? It's just the way you, you, you represent units. You know, if you have units of force to be kilogram, um, meter per second square, right? You can express it in terms of dimension as kilogram is mass, so this mass, m is length, so this l, and second is t, so that's t, then raised to the power of minus 2. So that is force, right? So that's force, that is what we have here. So you can calculate the dimension of any physical quantity from the unit. Once you know the unit, just replace the unit with the dimension uh, with the dimension in, bra in square bracket, and that is how you get the dimension of any physical quantity. But then this is what I want to ex explain. I want to talk about something called dimensional homoge uh, uh, homogeneity. So what does that mean? It means if you say an equation is dimensionally consistent or has dimensional homogeneity, what you're saying is each term in that in that equation have the same dimension. So let me use this as an illustration. If I have v squared equals u squared plus 2as, where v is velocity, u is also, but this is final velocity, right? This is final velocity. u is initial velocity. And A is acceleration. I'm going to talk about all of this later on. S, let's say this is distance. Now, what's velocity? Velocity is, let's talk about velocity, the unit or the dimension of velocity. The, the velocity is distance, right, which is length over, which is distance, right, which is length over time, which is second. So velocity is meter per second. Acceleration is meter per second square. And distance is just meter. If you write the dimension of this, this would be mass, uh, sorry, meter, not mass. This is meter, which is L, then time, which is T, raised to power minus, let me write it properly here. So that's L and T raised to the power of minus one. Then acceleration, we have this dimension. Since we have length, then the time is raised to the power of minus two. The distance, we have just L. Now, let's check if this equation is dimensionally consistent. So what that means is we want to show if the dimension of this part is the same as the dimension of this part, is the same as the dimension of this part. If they have exactly the same dimension, you see they are dimensionally homogeneous or dimensionally consistent. So let's look at that. So we know that v squared is equal to u squared. That's the equation given to us. 
and we know that phi has this dimension length then the time is to the power of minus one we know v2 we have exactly the same thing both of them are velocity their velocities then a has this dimension which is meter which is l that's length then second square right minus two then s is distance which is simply l now let's look for v squared v squared we have this l and t everything raised to the power of two if you try to solve for this you're going to take this power here and also take multiply this to this that will give you t raised to the power of minus two now that is v and that will give you the same thing as u because u and v they have the same dimension so they'll give you the same thing here now let's look for the dimension of u to as mind you when dealing with dimension you don't bother about the constant you throw the constant you focus on as they must produce the same dimension as this for you to say this equation is consistent is dimensionally consistent so as is like you multiplying this to this so what is l t raised to the power of minus 2 times l so l is power 1 times l is power 1 that will give you l raised to the power of 2 and t raised to the power of minus 2 that is exactly equal to v squared so we can confidently say that this equation is dimensionally consistent so in, in this concept applies to all equations in physics if an equation is not dimensionally consistent it implies there's an error in that equation so every scientist uh, knows this that whatever equation they are coming up with must be dimensionally consistent so these are some of the dimensions of common physical quantities in physics. So now to summarize, we've talked about physics, we've talked about measurements, and we've introduced the two categories of physical quantities. We've got the base quantities and the derived quantities. Then I told you that the base quantity essentially are the, the quantities on which every other quantity are based on. And those other quantities are called derived quantities. They are they are based on the on, on, on the fundamental quantities. Then we've talked about the prefixes in uh, SI units, and we've talked about dimensional analysis and dimensional consistency. So um, the next thing now is for us to solve some questions related to measurement. So let's take a look. Okay, let's solve some questions based on measurements in physics. So I'm going to get some questions from Testula UTME app. I'm going to go to question search and I'm going to select I'm going to select uh, physics then I'm going to search for measure I'm going to search for micro meter and uh, caliper and let's see what we get so let's take a look at question 4 from the year 2003 so the question says that if we have the length of a piece of block measured with this vernier caliper then what is the length of the glass block so basically what this question is saying is that we should tell what the reading of this vernier caliper is so from what we've discussed you start from this is one right this is 1 1.1 1.2 1.3 1.4 1.5 1.6 so first we have 1.6 now to get the rest of reading which is from this 1.6 to the edge of this vernier scale you look for where there's a direct intersection or where the line on the vernier scale coincide with the main scale and that is this particular point so, so where, what value is this particular point reading? So you just count one, two, three, then four. 
Mind you, we already have 1.6. Then the 1.6, you will add the extra value from the vanilla scale, which is what's what you have on the vanilla scale. You divide by the 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 like by the lowest value that the vanilla scale can read, and the lowest value that it can read is 0 0.01. So you divide whatever you have on this vanilla scale by 100, and that will give you 0 0.04 plus 1.6, and that will give you 1.64. So the answer is P. If you want to know more about this, check out the Marvin Office lab to fully understand how to read a vanilla, uh, vanilla caliper. Let's talk about question 2 from 2009. So the question says that okay we've got the question says is says as for which of the, which of the above can be measured using a micrometer screw gauge. Okay, so we have a, I is diameter of a small ball bearing, B is thickness of a piece of paper, C is diameter of a measuring cylinder, four is the length of a piece of wire. We use micrometer screw gauge to measure thickness of very small objects. So the first, which is the diameter of a ball bearing, then the second, which is the thickness of a piece of paper. You can use the micrometer to do that. But if you want to measure the diameter of a measuring cylinder, that's because measuring cylinder is much bigger you can't use it's not suitable micrometer screw gauge is not suitable for such use the micrometer is also not suitable for the length of a wire you can easily use um, you can easily use a meter rule for that the diameter of a measuring cylinder you can use a vinyl caliper for that so but for micrometer screw gauge one and two are the most suitable and that's option b so we're going to stop here and uh, in the next video, we're going, to, we're going to talk about motion and move forward on there.